Hey, what's up guys? Corey here. And today I am going to be talking about theology and answering y'all's questions. This is episode two of my podcast slash show on YouTube called Loving the Covenant. So welcome to Loving the Covenant. On this podcast, I talk about theology and politics, but really pretty much just about any topic goes. But uh, I want to stick with focusing on theological and political issues. Um, so like I said, today I'm going to answer some questions. I'm going to talk a little bit about theology, why it's important. Um, so let's just get right into it. Um, theology means the study of God, right? It's the study of God. And the only way to do this really properly um, is to uh, go to the Bible, right? Whatever the Bible teaches is theology in its most correct way to say that. I mean, you can say that people have bad theology and things like that, but um, if it's something that's not taught in Scripture or taught against Scripture, uh, it doesn't have a basis in Scripture, then it's not, you know, it's, it's not something that's true about God. So, yeah, and, and obviously this is important because... Uh, you know, it's this is about God. This is about God's attributes, what God says about Himself, and within this, you have things like the doctrine of salvation. I mean, theology is incredibly important. Without theology, you don't know anything about God, and uh, we have theology, yes, and natural revelation, but you know, we have special revelation, the Bible, to tell us specifics about this God. Um, and without without the Bible. Um, w without God revealing truth to humanity, um, I mean, that, that would just be, you know, detrimental. So theology is important because it's about God and it's about learning about God. It's what God says about himself. Uh, and you have to use scripture to do this. And uh, you have three kind of like classifications of theological study. You have biblical theology, systematic theology, and historical theology. Now, in a sense, um, systematic and biblical are biblical because they come from the Bible, right? And historical obviously is if it's based on Scripture. Um, so, but but the, there, there are still three different classifications. So biblical theology is, you know, studying different books of the Bible, the themes of the book, um, historical background of the book, the author of the book. Um, what is this specific book in the Bible saying? So th an example of biblical theology would be like, oh, let's look at the book of Matthew. What are the themes of this book? What is this book teaching? Who's the author of this book? What's the historical background of the book? And um, things like that. That's doing biblical theology. Uh, systematic theology is studying the doctrines of the Christian faith, right? Listing out and explaining the doctrines or teachings of the Christian faith especially the fundamental ones that make Christianity what it is, right? So within this, you have, you know, the doctrine of inerrancy, the doctrine of the Trinity, the doctrine of justification, the doctrine of sanctification, so on and so forth. Um, you know, an example of systematic theology would be like the 1689 Confession or the Westminster Confession. Um, uh, R.C. Sproul's Everyone is a theologian, Wayne Grudem's systematic theology. You know, these, those are examples of systematic theology. You know, it's, 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 it's going through all the doctrines that you need to know. Um, you know, and whereas you compare that to biblical theology and biblical theology is taking you, taking you through specific books of the Bible and telling you about these specific books. Um, historical theology is a uh, theology that has been taught throughout the ages in church history, right? So historical theology would be like, oh, what does John Calvin think about this? What does Spurgeon think about this? What do different creeds and confessions say and things like that? What, what is theologically believed and taught throughout church history? And obviously you have to compare that with the Bible and, you know, because the Bible is the, is the final authority on all of these things. So that's just a little bit about that. I, I wanted to talk about that open with that. And now I want to get specifically into some of the questions. I got some questions from people on TikTok, and I got questions from people on uh, Facebook, on my personal Facebook. Uh, 
Corey Chapman. I got a lot of questions on a group on Facebook that I that I'm an admin in called the Not Woke Reformed Pub. Um, I got a lot of questions, and I've got a couple of, of questions on TikTok. I'm going to try to answer a lot of these, but I don't think I'll get to all of them. So, without further ado, let's get right into it. Also, I fixed the scrolling problem. I figured out what was wrong. So now I can use Bible Hub with absolutely no issues. <clears throat> so let's get right into it. So I got a couple questions on TikTok. And... I'm going to read them out right now. Um, first one, what dat one cat kills veganism <laughs> asked me on TikTok, what are, what are my thoughts on Joe Biden's new gun laws? Uh, I, I'll just answer this very simply. It's garbage. Uh, in God's law, there's absolutely no restriction to people having weapons to, to defend themselves in any way. Um, in fact, you know, the idea of self-defense is taught in God's law, so liberals and leftists should just keep their hands off of, off of guns. Um, there's no restriction in Scripture on these things, and Scripture teaches the opposite. People all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament really had swords, bows, spears, all these types of things. Jesus told his disciples to buy swords in Luke. Uh, the book of Exodus says if someone breaks into your house in the middle of the night, you can kill them all these different things. It's kind of hard to kill someone who breaks into your house if they're armed and you're not. So, uh, what do I think about his gun laws? I think they're, I think they're garbage and I think you should just let people, uh, have their weapons. So there's that. Uh, next, next question comes from nerd craftsman on TikTok. Uh, doesn't Calvinism include predestination? Uh, yes, yes, it does. Um, very simply put, um, he goes on to say, but what about freedom of the spirit? Because God loves us so much, he gives us the choice to run to him or fall away. Well, he here's the thing. The Bible teaches that uh, no one has done good. Nobody can do good apart from Christ, right? Uh, Romans chapter 3 says that we're all, we're all sinners and that no one can do good, right? Um, now, obviously, in Christ, you can have good works, but apart from Christ, you can't do good at all. All you can do is sin. So you can't run to God. Your fallen nature won't let you, right? So um, it's not it's not an issue of you know being robots and not having making free choices. We make free choices in the sense that we pick what our desires uh, allow us to pick. You know, you make choices based on what you desire. The problem is the fallen man who is not in Christ can only choose sin because that's the only thing they want to choose. So there's there's that. And uh, I think I think I have a, another another question on TikTok. Let me look real quick. Uh, oh yeah, so JS, uh, sorry, J Swizzle forty five asks me if God knows our future and everything about us. How do we have free will? Um, you know, this goes back to the previous question. God predestined all things, and everything happens according to God's will, according to Ephesians one, and you know, election is taught in Romans nine. Um, we have we have free will in the sense that we make choices based on what we desire. We have the ability to make our own choices. We're not robots. That in Scripture, that idea does not come into conflict at all with God's sovereignty. So we still we we still have our own will. We have a free will in that sense. We don't have libertarian free will. Um, we make choices, but um, it's all predestined so that's those are the questions that i got on tiktok now i'm going to move over to facebook on uh the not woke Re not woke reform pub that i'm an admin in we have 322 uh people uh uh other other guys that are well yeah, i won't mention them just in case they don't want to be mentioned but you know there's a couple of other admins that uh, know i do this and i'm going to answer some of their questions too um, so let's just, let's just get right into it. I'm going to, I'm going to try to get to the ones on my personal Facebook, but I really don't know if I'm going to be able to do that because I'm already 10 minutes in. Um, all right. Um, uh, Sam asks me, why is presuppositional apologetics biblical or unbiblical? Like, is it, like, is it correct or not? <clears throat> I think presuppositional apologetics is absolutely biblical because, right, Presuppositionalism is about presupposing 
uh, on your part that God exists and the Bible is true and starting there and exposing uh, the unbelievers presuppositions, how it shows that they know God exists and how it doesn't work within their worldview. So like if you're talking to an atheist, every time an atheist opens their mouth, uh, they're, they're exposing their presuppositions and how it's inconsistent. In atheism, you can't have absolute truth or absolute morality. So every time they argue with you about something, uh, you know, it, it's a matter of, of truth. That's not consistent with their worldview. Truth only exists if God exists. And Romans 1 says they know God, that, that God exists. So what the goal of the presuppositionalist is to expose that, show them how they're borrowing from your worldview, uh, dismantle their entire worldview, um, and lift that suppression of truth. Um, because that's what they're doing. They know God exists. They suppress it. The goal of the presuppositionalist is to lift that uh, suppression and to bring evangelism in um, once that's, you know, done. So I think presuppositionalism is absolutely biblical because you're not seeking to prove to that person that God exists. And your starting point isn't a whole bunch of evidences. Your starting point is a biblical worldview, what God says and you are going from there. You're not starting with uh, something and then trying to work your way to God. You're not starting with neutrality. You're not letting them judge whether or not God exists. You're not trying to convince them that God exists. You're not leaving them with a foot to stand on. You're exposing and demolishing their worldview. Um, you know, you're answering them according to their folly. Um, not to be like them but to expose their worldview. So that that's my answer. Like the evidentialist approach lets the unbeliever judge God. The evidentialist approach does, you know, really doesn't start with scripture, really doesn't assume that, um, that uh, the unbeliever knows that God exists and that general revelation actually gets through to that person. Whereas the presuppositionalist recognizes that. Now you also have classical apologetics, which I'm not a classical guy. I think that's way better than it, just straight up evidentialism. There's a difference between classical and precept, and it's, you know, how we interpret Romans one. You know, what is the extent of the knowledge of the unbeliever and what they know about God? Is the knowledge immediate or mediate? Precept would say it's immediate. Classical would say it's mediate. Um, and you know, things like that. You know, I. You also have, you know, the utilization of natural theology, which a presupper like myself and like James White isn't against. It's just, are we trying to prove that God exists or use an argument uh, that shows uh, that, uh, that that proves that God exists or tries to teach them from general revelation in the kind of context where we assume that they don't really know what Romans 1 says or not, you know. Again, I think classical apologetics is is way better than evidential apologetics. It's just a you know it, it's it's a difference in approach and it's a difference in methodology. I think precept has the upper hand, and I think precept is abso absolutely biblical. Um, so, next question f from Sam: uh, What is covenantal theology? Uh, covenant theology. So, covenant theology is um, a framework. A uh, theological system, or, or like I said, framework that brings the entire Bible together in perfect unity, right? God has worked through history and through covenants, and it, it's how we read and, and, and uh, interpret the Bible. So the dispensationalist is going to divide the Bible up into different dispensations and interpret it that way, whereas the covenant theologian is going to interpret it in light of the covenants that God has uh, worked throughout history, which the Bible actually teaches, and that brings the Bible together in perfect unity. Um, it's a framework in which we read and interpret the Bible. Um, and there are three main covenants, right? You have the covenant of redemption, the covenant of grace, the covenant of works. The covenant of redemption is uh, that in eternity past, the three persons of the Trinity covenanted or agreed that they would redeem a people, right? Uh, the covenant of works was between God and Adam in the garden. Uh, Adam uh, was righteous based on his performance. Uh, you know, he, he was perfect so, you know, and, and sinless, so he, uh, he, that's how he was uh, justified before God. Now, obviously, he failed, and humans can't do that now because of sin. Um, 
And that's where the covenant of grace comes in, where God saves people by grace. Now, there is a difference between Reformed Baptists, at least 1689 Federalists, and Presbyterians on this issue. The 1689 Federalist position says that the new, that says that the new covenant is the covenant covenant of grace, and the Presbyterian says that the covenant of grace and the new covenant are distinct. I think, me personally, I lean towards the Federalist view. I think it's complicated, and I think both sides can make convincing arguments. I'm not sure. But um, I think it makes sense to say that the new covenant is the covenant of grace. And I'll just leave it at that. But that's what covenant theology is. Uh, Blake Wimberly, one of my fellow admins on uh, the Not Woke Reform Pub, says, Christmas or no? I I'm assuming you mean, should a Christian celebrate Christmas or not? Is it wrong to or is it okay to? I don't think anybody has to celebrate Christmas. I, I don't think it's a command in Scripture, obviously. But I see absolutely nothing wrong with a Christian um, eating, feasting, putting up a tree, and giving gifts, and, re and, and celebrating Christ on December 25th. Uh, God is the one who made the day December 25th. God is the one who made the trees. Trees are not pagan. God is the one who uh, gives gifts to his children, right? God is the, uh, you know, God is the one who gives all these things. So I don't see a, a problem with doing these things on this particular day of the year. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't think it's pagan. I think I think winters was made by God, not pagans. Uh, God made it, so it's perfectly fine. Also, if you look in early church history, I believe Tertullian, and I might be uh, mispronouncing his name, uh, Hippolytus, Hi Hi Hippolytus, whichever, I think it's Hippolytus, uh, early church history and, and the, some of their writings uh, teach that Christ was born in winter, you know, December, January. Um, Roger, Roger Beckwith, uh, he has a book about, you know, dating Christ's birth. It, well, it, it includes it. Um, and uh, he argues for this. So from a church historical perspective, early church history teaches that it, he was born in winter. Right, December or January, you know, to two, two, two dates that you kind of get, uh, you know, December twenty fifth, January sixth, somewhere around there. And I don't, I even even if you didn't have that, I don't see a problem with taking one day and celebrating Christ's birth on that day. Now, the only the only issue that I have with with Christmas traditions, kind of too, if we don't make it about Jesus at all, right? Um, or if we lie about Santa Claus, I don't think we should tell kids that Santa's flying around. Um, and I think we should tell them about Christ instead. That's my only issue. That's it. Um, now, uh, the real Saint Nick, I think is a much better story. <laughs> Defending the doctrine of the Trinity and punching Arius in the face for denying it. I think that's way better. So that, that's what I think about Christmas. Um, Blake asks me, how do I share the gospel and what biblical passages do I use? Um, also, real quick, uh, the wise men gave gifts, gifts to Christ in celebration of his birth. Just throwing that out there. Um, how do I share the gospel and what biblical passage do I use? So how I share the gospel is usually like this. It's kind of like what Ray Comfort does, but I, I throw you know, a ref, kind of a reformed spin in there because he's not reformed. I'll, I'll do the whole thing, you know, um, you know, God gave his law, gave the Ten Commandments, you broke them, just like everybody else, and um, if a criminal breaks the law, he gets punished for it, and if a sinner breaks God's law, which he's going to do, then he gets punished for it, right? Uh, the Bible talks about hell, you, you have to talk about hell, um, but if someone pays the fine or the bail for the criminal in the courtroom, then they can go free. Well, Jesus, the Son of God, the one who is God and man, lived a sinless life, died on the cross, and rose from the dead. In his death, he pays the fine. He pays the bail. And he rose from the dead, forever defeating sin and death. And you must repent and trust in him. You must turn away from your sins and put your faith in Christ for salvation. That's what I usually go with, right? I, I, I do the whole thing, right? Um, 
that's usually how I do it. What biblical passage do I use? So what, what do I get my inspiration from and what do I use to like define the law and the gospel? Um, I definitely use Exodus 20, the 10 commandments, right? To expose why they need Christ. First Corinthians 15 explicitly defines the gospel, the end of the four gospels. And you know, I, I'll go to, I'll go to one place. Let's go to, um, hold on. Oh gosh. Is it going to do this now? Oh no, it still doesn't work well. Uh, Mark, <clears throat> the book, the gospel of Mark, um, Mark one, one, <clears throat> um, yeah, gosh, is it not letting me type it in? <clears throat> am I, I'm, am I still going to have problems with this? <clears throat> Mark chapter one. There we go. But I want to go to the ESV. So Mark chapter 1. Now let's read. This is one of my favorite passages because it's about the kingdom of Christ. Um, now after John, beginning at verse 14 in Mark chapter 1. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. So, the, you know, <clears throat> one reason I really like this is because it talks about the kingship and the kingdom of Christ and that he's brought it. Um, and you know, that we should include talking about this, um, about Christ's kingship and lordship and things like that. Um, but there is a clear call to repent and believe the gospel, you know, repenting of your sins and belief, faith. So there's a clear call to repentance and faith here. Nothing about asking anyone into your heart, nothing about praying this prayer. It's repent and believe repentance and faith. Uh, this is one of my favorite places to go to, um, you know, just, just, you know, I, I mentioned first Corinthians 15, so we can go there first Corinthians 15. Let's just go there. In the ESV, you know, you start at verse three and you keep going and he's clearly defining the gospel as Christ's death and resurrection. You know, Christ died and he rose from the dead. So th these are just, a, you know, a couple places. Now you have other places in the Bible, you know, Jesus saying that his blood is going to be given for the ransom of many. You have the New Testament saying that, you know, he paid the debt. You have Galatians and Romans which talk about justification. And, you know, it's not by works of the law. This is court case language. This is, this is um, forensic, right? <clears throat> so j just all those kinds of things is, is what I would what I would say and what I would use, you know, you also have Peter in Acts uh, 2, you have Paul in Acts 17, and how they're interacting with unbelievers, doing evangelism, doing apologetics, and all these things. I think it's beautiful, and I think it works, right? So that that's what I would say, Blake. <clears throat> I'm definitely not going to get to all of the questions. I'll have to answer the other ones another time. Oh, gosh, the election fraud. So here, here's what I think about the election fraud. You can go to Crowder. You can go to Daily Wire. You can go to Apologia, James White, Cross Politic. And they're, you know, they all talk about it. Bottom line is this. God's law says if you have two to three witnesses minimum, uh, you have sufficient evidence. As long, as long as you have two to three independent lines of witness. Well, we have 237, I think 237 pages of eyewitness evidence. You have the whole thing with the, uh, uh, machines that took in votes. You have people in Arizona and other places given Sharpies. You have, um, people's votes, not counting zeros being added them, not letting you see votes being counted. You have videos of people seemingly throwing votes out. Um, you have all of these lawsuits. You have lawsuits going to the Supreme court. Um, I mean, you, you have videos of people covering up windows. You have so much, you have so, you have so many reasons and there's so much eyewitness evidence that to say that, that, that there's no mistakes <clears throat> and no election fraud in any way whatsoever is just absurd. Um, it is just absurd. Like there's definitely issues here. Um, there's tons of evidence and to say otherwise is just not true. Um, 
I'm sorry if I botch your name. I love you on uh, Provoked. I think Provoked is such a good um, show. I, I love what you do there. Uh, it's I think it's Desiree Maze. It might be Desiree, but I'm pretty sure it's Desiree. <clears throat> she just says masks. Okay. <clears throat> Gosh, I don't know. Like my voice. It's like I'm losing my voice or something. It's weird. Desiree Mays, masks. What do I think? I think a couple of things. I think from a biblical worldview, masks is not a way that should be pursued, and it definitely shouldn't be mandated. Leviticus 13, you have leprosy going around. If you're well and you don't have it, your life doesn't change. If you're sick, you get quarantined. Nothing about making everybody wear masks and shutting their businesses down, um, <clears throat> especially for a long period of time, or really any period of time. So mask mandates aren't biblical. They're not something that are in accordance with God's law at all. My basis for that is Romans 13, Leviticus 13, and just the whole law of God. Um, there are studies, you know, Crowder, Apologia, James White, Cross Politic, Daily Wire. All these guys talk about this. There are studies that show that regular cloth masks, uh, more people get COVID doing that. You're more likely to get COVID wearing those than not. Um uh, the New England Medical Journal has a study where Marines did a military level quarantine where they wore masks, they sanitized everything, they social distanced, they did everything perfectly for an extended period of time, and COVID still spread among them. If they can't do it, if their masks don't work, then we don't have a chance. A virus is going to virus. If the Marines can't do it, regular folks aren't going to be able to do it. Um, take the masks off. That's what I think. <clears throat> So, let's keep going here. Brandy uh, Bergeron, maybe that's how you pronounce it. Uh, why do bad things happen to good people? This is a great time of year for that, for not to mention the loss of COVID, but really the Lord has caused. Okay. So, why do bad things happen to good people? They don't. There aren't good people. The only bad thing that happened to a good person was the crucifixion of Christ. Because he was the only good person. Nobody deserves good things. Here's the thing. If, if human beings weren't sinners, none of these kinds of things would happen. I, I don't think, you know, not every every tragic thing isn't necessarily a morally bad thing, right? Uh, but if someone, obviously if a human being does something bad to another human being, that's a bad thing, right? Tornadoes aren't evil, right? Uh, uh, natural disasters in of, them, you know, in of themselves are not evil. So, right? Um, so one thing that I would say is that, um, these kinds of things happen to bad people and, uh, God has a good purpose for them, obviously to glorify himself. Uh, and he has a good purpose, uh, for the Christian, for these things, to sanctify them, to bring them closer to him. This is what Romans eight says, um, Genesis 50, you know, People mean it for evil. God means it for good. And all things happen according to God's will, and that's good. God's will is perfect, right? So that's that's my – it really is that simple. Uh, that's my answer to this question. So um, last question on this Facebook group. Uh, why are liberals so addicted to oppression? The, the simple answer to that is they don't have a biblical worldview and they hate the biblical worldview. So oppression, like, why do they talk about oppressed people groups that aren't really oppressed? Well, I would say because of things like Marxism, cultural Marxism, and unbiblical worldview, intersectionality, all of those things. But, you know, why are they so oppressed with oppre obsessed with oppressing others, right? It's because they're evil. And, you know, the left right now is very influenced by Marxism. And that's all about oppressing other people. You know, I mean, we're talking about a party and a group of people that's okay with murdering babies, taking away guns and really demolishing uh, anything that stands for Christ. That's why. That's really why. Um, actually, you know, I, I have some more time. I'm going to, I'm going to go to my, my personal Facebook page right now. So let me, let me just get there. Not going to be able to answer all this. Um, 
Here's some here's some theological questions from Marce, uh, Marcel Atkins on my personal Facebook, Corey Chapman. Uh, why doesn't God just kill Satan? God doesn't just kill Satan because he has a purpose in everything that goes on in this life. He has a good purpose for it. That's the biblical answer. Um, he will be ultimately, he's already been defeated at the cross, and one day he will be totally destroyed. Uh thrown in the lake of fire forever he will he, his his destination is eternity in the lake of fire um but uh, god has a purpose for everyone and everything that is in the creation right now he has a he has a good purpose for everything being here uh, that's uh, you know it, it's ultimately to glorify himself uh it, it's also um you know to Christ's kingdom is winning. It's to, I, I think one reason is to further show his victory and things like that. But it, it's because God has a good purpose for it. And I personally, as a post-millennialist, love seeing the kingdom of Christ totally crush other things that are not of the kingdom of Christ. And I think that's one reason. So we'll just, we'll just leave that there. How can we have free will if God already knows the future? I kind of already answered this before, so I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get into that again. How can Jesus Christ be both God and man? Jesus is one eternal person. He's one divine person that's always existed as the Son of God. He's always been God. He took on a human nature. He has a full, he, he has a full 100% true human nature, human body, human soul, which united to his divine nature. His divine nature and human nature do not mix. He is one person with two natures united. This is what we see in John 1. This is what we see throughout the Gospels. Um. Uh, Richard Brown, what is the axiom of your worldview? And he goes on to say he's talking about epistemology. If you're a scriptural presuppositionalist, how it would be the Protestant canon. So yeah, like the, the Protestant canon, the Bible, is what I base my worldview on. If that's what you're, what you mean by asking that. Um, however, you may be correct on your theology, depending on the word modified. In light of that, I will assume that you are therefore some version of an evidentialist. I'm not an evidentialist. Prove me wrong. Got to go. We'll check later. Um, I don't really know what has to be proven here. I mean, my worldview is based on the Bible. Um, I, so, uh, epistemology, I'll, I'll just respond, you know, epistemology, uh, Christians have a revelational epistemology. Without God, you really can't know anything. So, God has to reveal knowledge to you. That's why revelational epistemology is true. Um, so, that, that would be my answer. Uh to this um and if, if that's if you don't think that's a sufficient answer maybe i misunderstood you um richard uh feel free to ask me again and clarify uh ryan fischel asked me a lot of questions and th th this this is what what he said you know i'm just gonna go ahead and answer all of these i mean i have i have time uh what are the christians uh political boundaries uh, when is politics an idol and when is it not? I think politics is an idol. If we, uh, one example is if we put our hope and trust in politicians to save us, uh, when it's only Christ that can do so, um, don't worship the state, worship Christ. So political boundaries, we should definitely be involved in politics, but we should be, we should do it in light of a biblical worldview. If we're interpreting politics with something other than scripture or going against scripture, we have, we have crossed the boundary. And obviously, idolatry crosses the boundary as well. Can a Christian be passionate about politics and not be an, and it not be an idol? Yes, because uh, you know the Bible talks about politics, and it's in a sense a political book. If we're talking about the kingdom of Christ and it invading and taking over our world, right? So. Uh, Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That means something, right? He has something to say to the rulers of the earth. So yes, we should be passionate about politics. It's an idol if we cross those boundaries, like I said earlier. Don't idolize politicians. Don't worship the state. Uh, what are healthy ways a Christian can express their political views? By using scripture, right? Using God's law, using what Christ says, talking about Christ's kingdom, those, those kinds of things, just to, just to make it simple. What are unhealthy ways to cross those boundaries? What are two, uh, what are two Christians to do when they, when they strongly disagree politically? Um, 
it depends what they're disagreeing on, right? I mean, if they're disagreeing on whether or not people should own, you know, fully automatic weapons, you know, that's not even an issue of, of, of secondary denominational importance. Like, you shouldn't even divide and worship on that. I think the Bible is okay with fully automatic weapons. But, you know, it's not so important that you should divide on. Now, if you're disagreeing on something like abortion, one side saying abortion is murder and one isn't, this is a first importance fundamental issue. I would say the person affirming abortion isn't even a Christian. So it just depends on on, on what they're disagreeing on. Um, all right. Stephen Hake. I went to high school with this guy. Stephen, I know you're an atheist. Um. Stephen, you asked a lot of questions, and I, I, I'm, I don't think I'm going to be able to answer all of them right now, but I'll, I'll just start reading your first comment. Here's, here's some interesting ones you can look up. If God created good and evil, doesn't that mean he is just fighting himself? Also, considering he kills people left and right in the Old Testament, does that make him good? Um, God, okay, so God created everything very good. God, is, God decreed that sin and evil would exist. But God is not the author of sin. You know, we're the ones that make the decision to sin. So he's not the author of, of sin. Um, he, so he's not fighting himself. Um, and uh, considering he kills people left and right in the Old Testament, that, does that make him good? Yeah, God is good. God is the standard of good, right? In atheism, Stephen, uh, objective good and evil doesn't even exist purpose to life and objective truth does not exist because you don't have an external objective standard to tell you that it's just whatever your preference is in your in your brain because all truth is just summed down to whatever you think which is totally subjective um so also murder is wrong killing in a there's a difference between killing and murder right um god has the right to take the life of anybody because they've sinned against him god wouldn't do this if no one sinned that's why death happens. God has every right to take the life of his creatures if they sin against him. So that that's one thing that I would say. To go on, why put a tree with forbidden knowledge in a garden anyways? It's like a child with too much power who isn't watching his children. This would be avoided. And he thought him maybe, it's kind of running on the sentence here, maybe not put the cookie jar in front of the kids. Also a topic when they call demons demons in the Bible, I believe there's something about it relating to sickness is not actual demons. Oh, okay, hold on. I'm just going to read the whole thing and then respond to some of them. But when they refer to false idols, they mean demons. Something interesting to look up. Also, if you ever touch on the books that were taken out of the Bible, there's a lot of them. Why does man decide that some God-breathed word is not fit and that the end result of the Bible should be trusted through mistranslations and these books being taken out that's a huge run-on sentence i'm going to respond to some of those things um there is nothing magical about the fruit in the garden it was literally it's literally just a rule on whether or not adam would have obeyed or not would have obeyed god or not uh, i mean yeah he told him like if, if he eats of it he's going to surely die why because he's disobeying god he's rebelling against god the whole point is the sin of disobeying god and not believing his word and what he says and rejecting him it, there's nothing magical or special about the fruit. It was just fruit. Uh, we don't know what the fruit was either. People say it's an apple. Some people say it's something else. I have no idea what it was. Um, let's look a little bit at your, at, at the rest of your things. Uh, demons are fallen angels. They're not idols that are made with human hands, and they're not sicknesses. Um, A lot of books that were taken out of the Bible. Why do we get to decide? We so we didn't. The church didn't decide what books are in the canon and what church, what books are not in the canon. The church is the discoverer of the canon. Um, the Old Testament books, right? Christ affirmed all the Old Testament books, and the Old Testament books were were written by prophets or people associated with prophets, right? And um, and confirmed by prophets. And the New Testament is the words of Christ and his apostles. He uh, he gave his apostles apostolic authority to write scripture. So all of the New Testament is is what God had the had the apostles or people associated with the apostles to write down. So the entire New Testament is being done under the authority of the apostles which was given to them 
by Christ who has all authority because he's the Messiah and he's 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 the God man. So yeah. And I, I guess you're talking about the apocryphal books that were that aren't included. Uh you know um the Jews never included them as scripture. Uh, Jesus doesn't say they're scripture. He actually says the opposite, that the that the law, the prophets, and the writings are scripture in Luke 24. That's the 39 books that we have in our Old Testament right now. Gnostic Gospels, if we're, you're talking about that, they're not included because Gnosticism is condemned by the apostles in the New Testament. Um, things like the Book of Enoch was never, I mean, it, it, it's never been included. Um, and... Uh, other books, again, n never, never been included. It's just the books that we have here, and it's always been that way. Anything else is just false. So, that that that's that's what I'll say to those. Um, Stephen, you asked some more questions, which I'll get into. You said that you wanted to talk about some of these things and, and clear them up, and that you're personally atheist. Why did God harden Pharaoh's heart? If was he already too far gone, or did God decide he was just going to make him do what he wanted to do and take away his free will? We have a will. We have free will. We've established this in this in this show. Um, Pharaoh's heart was already hard because he is dead in his sin, right? He, he, he was never converted. But God hardened his heart by uh, letting Pharaoh pursue what he wanted to pursue, right? Passing over him and just letting him have what he wants. Like, you want all this corruption? Take it. It's going to make you worse. Um, so in a sense, yeah, Pharaoh is already too far gone because he doesn't have the choice to choose God anyway. But God in in uh, giving Pharaoh over to his desires and his sin and what he wanted to pursue, his heart got harder and harder and harder. This is how this is what Romans one says about about God giving people over to their desires. That's what hardens their heart. It's not God doing something in the person's heart like he would with regeneration um, or being born again. Uh, so that's the thing. Uh, if the Bible was around 6,000 years ago, does that mean dinosaurs are not real? I believe dinosaurs are real. I'm a young earth creationist. I believe that uh, man and dinosaurs walked the earth at the same time. Uh, I believe dinosaurs and, and humans were made on the same day of creation week. Um, uh, I'm, I'm still reading your question, Stephen. Uh, Noah's flood, no animals remains were found trying to swim up. Instead, all were swimming down. Wouldn't animals drowning me trying to struggle upwards? Just some thoughts I've wondered. Um, well, there's fossils all over the world of all kinds of creatures. Um, <clears throat> tr trying to swim up and trying to swim swim down. I mean, I I haven't studied that specifically. I assume that you would find both. I really haven't studied the swim up swim down thing. But I mean, the water's you know rising up. I mean, their their arms are going to be flailing everywhere, right? And they're going to die. And you have these fossils all over the place. I mean, you have marine fossils in high mountains. How did they get there? They didn't swim there. Um, you have fossils all over the world of creatures that aren't found in those places in the world, typically. It's like, how did they get there? Um, God says the entire world was, was flooded. Um, now, you know, animals that we have today... Our survivor, our, our descendants of survivors from the ark. Uh, not every single species was on the ark. Every kind of animal was on the ark. They're not the same thing. Obviously, sea creatures weren't because they were able to survive in the water. Um, no, so you said, yeah, no animals' remains were found trying to swim up. Instead, all were swimming down. Wouldn't animals drowning be trying to struggle upwards? Show me the study on that. I'm pretty sure that's not the case. Um, but I, I'll be honest, I have not looked into that specifically, but there's tons of evidence in the fossil record of a worldwide flood. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's, uh, that concludes this Q&A right now. Um, 
one last thing that I'll say is that um, I, I, I very much enjoy doing this. Please comment questions and answers. I'm, I'm sorry. Please comment questions. Oh, I mean, answers if you want. Continue to comment questions on my TikTok, on my YouTube, on Facebook, and my social media. Um, feel free to ask questions about things that were even said here. And stay tuned for, uh, for more shows. Peace out.